Hey, hey, welcome everybody, friends near and far. It's another week. It's another episode of the Regeneration Podcast. And a good episode it will be. We'll get to that. You're uh, you're stuck with just uh, your two favorite peeps, Mike Sauter and Michael Martin. Um, Michael, I got I to make a, a confession. Last week you were talking about barn birds and... Barn swallows. Right. Yeah. But okay, so did you possibly have a misspelling on a tweet today? Because I think it said shallows. It did. You know what happened is uh, it was. I thought I had the bird wrong. Honestly, I know there's a type of swallow, but I'm thinking the swallows are called Toronto. I honestly thought maybe this type of bird was called. No, no, that was uh, what do you call it? Uh, Autocorrect. Okay, gotcha. On Twitter, did that to me, you bastards. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't notice that till this morning. Pardon me. They're kind of a sundial of sorts for the weather for you in some ways. What's going on with them? So yeah, so last week I mentioned that I I mean uh, this time of year I start watching to see when the barn swallows leave mm-hmm. and uh they left which usually they leave in the first week of september i think last year was about the seventh or eighth uh but they left early one time they left around uh the feast of the assumption which is august 15th and uh that year we had uh, early frost we had frost on september 19th a hard frost which killed all of our winter squash all of our tomatoes peppers it was devastating. It was yeah. So the last few weeks of the CSA were, were slim pickings. We had stuff, but not as much as we had planned. And uh, so I, I have, have to think that we probably won't get a hard frost September 19th, which act, was actually the earliest in my entire life. Okay. But probably toward the end of September. I bet yeah. Michaelmas will probably have a hard frost, probably be in early winter. Like so we'll have, a, we'll have some people, they can document that. You know, it's here, it's on YouTube, we'll see how it goes. And actually, I, I, heard, I heard from somebody from Twitter who uh, lives a little bit north and west of here. He lives near Lansing, and he actually, he said he, they, they left at his place, too. Okay. I'll have to look at the monastery where I work. I don't work there. I work. To, uh, I'm still over there on occasion. But, you know, they've been my kind of bellwether for that type of thing. I didn't know what their early arrival or or farewell portended but you know this time of year uh it could be you know that things settle in in september the school year is so dominant but uh you mentioned michaelmas that uh you know i my stomach always feels like in a weird place whether i'm trying to build up energy for something but it's very ambient energy and uh I was just thinking, I'll have to reread it, but Steiner on Michaelmas could be an episode for us. That's some of his best stuff. Remember, it, it sounds so cheesy the first time you hear it, but tell me if I have it wrong. He's saying that like there's a calling for people this time of year. And for me, it does resonate with this kind of ambient energy, but it's not focused. It can be anxiety provoking. But he says, you know, it's um, you take the you're trying to take something of the iron of right. the of the shooting stars of August. And if, you know, metaphorically, imaginatively, certainly imaginatively, but, you know, really trying to incorporate that, that you can forge that to something kind of more resolute, more focused for for fall. You know, and again, we have the academic calendar and and that has killed the church calendar in some ways. But I wonder, even if the academic calendar, which was, you know, September, people start getting involved in activities. Let's say school ran from June to June. Will we still feel this way this time of year, I wonder, you know? Well, in England, they call this, this, this semester semester Michaelmas term okay so that's exactly, they, yeah. even though as Ronald Hutton told us last week England that was is, quite an episode it's probably the, one of the least religious countries on earth in the west yeah. anyway <clears throat> that uh that still persists in the language that, yeah that the church calendar still persists there and uh and the thing you were saying about with uh Steiner and the Perseid meteor showers that happened earlier in August uh they kind of for him they they imaginatively recapitulate the battle of St. Michael and the, and the fallen angels, right, right? Right. Which brings this, what he says, meteoric iron into our, into the world and kind of, uh, in a way can invigorate our thinking, Okay. which, which Lord knows we could certainly use. You bet. You bet. Uh, we could be in control of it as opposed to other people thinking our thoughts for us. Right. <laughs> Pretty heavy. So speaking of things in the sky, we've got, a. Uh, a subject today, I'll name the subject. It's called cloud busting. Cloud busting is something I'm vaguely familiar with through, uh, for me, it was a, a path from Peter Gabriel, probably very familiar with the name, but maybe when I went to college, 1986, saw Peter Gabriel in concert. At that time, he was doing the album So, and uh, um, I believe it was Don't Give Up was on that album, right? He had this uh, yes. touring, she wasn't touring with him, 
it was somebody else, but a great song, Don't Give Up, that had these haunting vocals by uh, Kate Bush. Mm -hmm. And so then I looked into her a little bit, saw this thing about cloud busting. We're going to mention the name of a German uh, psychologist, free thinker. Talk about free thinking in the sort of St. Michael. <laughs> uh, cloud busting, tell me like, uh, you know, I know a little bit about it. How did, uh, how did this thing first become even on your radar? Yeah, I didn't. I uh, Well, as you mentioned, it came through Kate Bush and her song uh, Cloud Busting, which is on shows up on her 1985 album uh, Hounds of Love. And I love that album. I mean, I really didn't here in the United States. We didn't know anything about Kate Bush, you know, and she was a huge phenomenon in uh, in England. And I think I may have seen her once or twice on this British television show used to be on PBS, the Kenny Everett video show. Never heard of it. Which was kind of cool. They actually, that's where I was first introduced or first saw the Pretenders and bands like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a comedy show. <clears throat> but anyway, I don't remember seeing Kate Bush on that. But I do remember hearing on the radio here in, in Detroit, where I lived at the time, uh, some British uh, mute band was on the radio being interviewed and, and they mentioned they, they were letting them spin a couple of their own tunes and 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 they spun uh a song that has become back into popular culture running up that hill yeah by kate bush which uh from with stranger things be, became a hit again yeah. oh so it's associated with stranger things i saw the first season of yeah. that i liked it enough that i could have continued watching well with this yeah. this most recent season i guess that song i don't know i haven't watched it the song oh. features it is an important thematic element i guess that's a great song but so i heard that song and i said man i gotta get this this album and i bought boys and girls you might not know what this means a cassette tape that i listened to in my car and i'll never forget uh when i bought the cassette my my now brother-in-law, he was actually one of my friends back then, just married my, my sister about a few years ago. And we get in the car and I put the tape in. I said, we got to check this out. So we're, we're sitting there listening for a second before we drive. And there's this moment in Hounds of Love where there's this big thunderous drum roll and Kate Bush sings out, let's exchange the experience. And my, my brother-in-law looks at me and goes, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> I mean, if you hear any rumbling for me, it's I'm I'm... I'm usually doing this podcast from home, but when you mentioned a cassette, I'm sitting at a desk where we have some old cassettes, and I think I have that cassette. Do probably. you really? Yeah, I'm not going to waste people's time, but I just glanced in there and Get. almost knocked out the internet. Get uh, out! Yeah. yeah, Kate Bush cassette running up. So anyway, there. yep. So short story long. <laughs> so after this, I worked at a bookstore at the time, actually, which which is where I met my wife and one of our friends who worked there. You know, it was a lull in the action at the bookstore. I think it was Friday afternoon. It's got really slow. So we were listening to Kate Bush on the PA in the store. And I just went to say, talking about how much I like this album. And Cloud Busting came on. And it's a cool song. And we're talking about it. And my cool friend video. said, my friend tells me, well, you know, it's, uh, it's a, based on a true story. I said, you no, know, really? What's it about? And it's about uh, this in, in the video. Um this this little boy played by Kate Bush, whose father is a scientist, invents this machine to make it rain. And in the video, it's essentially the FBI or somebody from the Department of Justice comes to arrest him. No, is, no, no. Trust your neighborhood intelligence agencies, Michael. Yeah, right. Anyhow, yeah, continue. On. So let's so I'm gonna well, let's play a little clip of the song just so okay. people can get a hang of it. I see somebody knocking on your window. It could be the Fed. Okay, so. Here we go. Yeah, it probably is the feds. They were the feds. We tried to actually, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, we tried to record this yesterday, but my internet went out, so it's pretty pretty convinced <laughs> the feds jumped on us. So here's a clip of Kate Bush's cloud busting. Okay, that's pretty good. So, so this song, uh, 
you know, inspired this conversation with my friend. She tells me it's a true story. And then she pulls off the shelf at the bookstore, this book right here, a book, book of, of dreams. dreams by Peter Reich, who is or still alive, is the son of Wilhelm Reich. Do you think he's still alive? I actually think that's he is. I looked it up this morning, actually. And he's, we should get him on sometime. He's not. I mean, he's probably in his seventies. I'm guessing. The daffier, the better. Uh, he's probably. I think he was born. In, he's like the age of the Beatles, probably. <clears throat> a little younger, I think. I know his sister is still alive because I know somebody who knows his sister, and she is <laughs> a great. bit older. That's great for social cachet. I know yeah. somebody who knows somebody who once got a wrong phone number from a guy who knows William Wright. That's me. That's yeah. right. That's, yeah. It's about as much as I have right here. Uh-huh. But anyway, so I read the book, and especially the first half of the book is fascinating because it tells the story of Peter Reich with his father, and uh, Reich, who was a, a psychoanalyst who had trained with Freud, who was a, an associate of Freud's, you know, of that wonderful generation of psychoanalysts who had been uh, under the tutelage of Freud, like uh, Jung, uh, Reich himself, Adler, you know, these people who came up in that generation, really some, some of, I think, the most creative uh, psychoanalytic thinker thinking ever before psychoanalysis was taken over by the pharmaceutical industry. Hey man, what a sad devolution. Hell it is. Know. And, they, and uh, anyway, so the book's fascinating. And a, a big part of the book is when Peter, who was then probably about 10 years old, would go with his father on these uh, expeditions or something, whatever you want to call it, to make it rain. Use taking their cloud buster. And I want to let me drop. Uh, I'm going to drop another screen share here. This is going to be a picture. I'm this is guessing going to be an image. Up. Yes, we're going to see whose it is. Kate Bush's, William Reich's, Peter Reich's, or I'm guessing could be Michael Marks and Cloud Buster. Oh, uh, it's not mine. Uh, let's see where we go. So here, can you see that? I can't actually. You you can? No, I cannot. Okay, let me see. Let me do it this the right way here. So I got the wrong thing to share. Okay. I'll talk about William Reich a little bit, and you'll have. Okay, answer. can you see that? Let's see, it said started screen sharing, and it comes up. There's the image. Okay. Google. Yeah. Good. That's, so that's this is firing up something. This is Wilhelm Reich. Okay. Uh, in his fifties. Now, this is his cloudbuster, which is a mammoth cloudbuster. When you see the picture of mine, you'll go, "Wow!" And let me tell people listening to us on YouTube, you know, and vice versa. You uh-huh. can, uh, I mean, listening to us on a podcast, you can find this at YouTube with these images and so forth. You know, at a the Regeneration Podcast, Google, yeah. that and my last name, Sauter, you'll find it on YouTube. Yeah, right. and so it's this big thing. And his, uh, I guess the pipes on his were nine to 12 feet long, which is twice the, what <laughs> almost twice the length of mine. His were steel, I believe. Okay. Yeah, and you can see he's got some kind of conduit or hose from the back of the pipes. Mm-hmm. And here's the story is, and, and Peter Reich tells about this, um, that... Um, where was I? So, so he would go out on these expeditions with his father and make it rain. And it, it's interesting where, in fact, I think it was also Reich's son-in-law who would also come with them. It's probably in his 20s or 30s at the time. And what there's it's an actual story that in 1950s uh, in, in Maine, which is where Reich, who was originally from Austria, lived at the time, there was, a, I think it was 51, 52, a really uh, horrible... Uh, drought that was going to take out the entire blueberry crop mm-hmm. and the farmers around in Wrangley, Maine, where, where Reich lived, came to him and said, can you do something about this? We heard you can make it rain. And he made it rain. He, he, I think he, he, he pulled up some rain and I think they got an inch or two of rain, which saved the crop. If I did that, it would endear me to the farmers around here. You know, well, Not well, a, it's a good way to be neighborly for one thing. Well, and let me show you this other image if I can. Um, From Catholic sources. Sure. So here you go. So here's a, oh, it's not showing up. What's going on here? My pull. screen says there's nothing to show here, which seems crazy. Yeah, it just disappeared <laughs> on me. Okay, let me see. I like the fact that there's words there. I don't know why this one keeps, this, for some reason, this one keeps dropping out on me. So let's see what I can, oh, give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> All right, there we go. We have software that takes out some of these silence. Okay, good. Here we go. Here we go. All right, here it comes. I like how we both have kind of bifocals, I guess. We both look at the computer screens in the same way. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? The bottom one-tenth of our glasses. Okay. Huh. I still says nothing. Keeps dropping out here. Let's go. Can you see that? Okay. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is is from uh, San Bernardino 
daily news. You can't see the date because that green box is annoying. But this is from 1952. New chemical discovery permits rain to be controlled like weather from tap. Um, was so like working with this or was this like an opposite approach? No, but this is this is stuff that was going on in the 50s. And it's why it's I th think it's kind of fascinating to me is that and I remember being a kid in the 70s and 80s, there were news reports regularly, you know, not every week or anything, but on a habitual basis about developments and learning and how, how to control the weather. Yeah. And recently you may have seen it. Uh, I know it was one of them. I saw a story December 20th, I think of 2020. There was a story about China who was, they were going to up their uh, weather controlling game. And apparently I saw this recently, a video, an interview, a news interview. I saw, I caught it on, on Twitter, but I th think it's from a mainstream source that uh, during the Olympics in, in Beijing, China actually displayed their weather controlling prowess. I'll have to look into that one because I have but seen I've seen mainstream reporting that like they're certainly looking into this. You know, at, yeah. at the same time, we know that, again why wouldn't they be trying if they could? Like you and I might think it's nefarious the way you go about it, but people shouldn't be shocked that they're trying to do this. It seems very natural. On the other hand, just like um, anything else, there's probably good and bad ways. But then if we if we're allowed to talk about it for some reason people think you're like crazy for even thinking they would do this they're trying to do everything but then that's the point right and so it's look 19 so this is 70 years ago right mm -hmm. this is 70 years so from what i've read that this really became a a, a thing following world war ii that like you know, what's now called darpa and other kinds of organizations were trying to find ways to control the weather and i think there was another one, uh, thing i saw just recently some Mideast country, was it Bahrain or they, they made it rain, they seeded the clouds and they had an inch of rain in the desert. Hmm. So, so, and, and the thing is, I mean, when, uh, so here's, so what happened with Reich though, is Reich, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, it was eventually arrested. I mean, cause one of the thing, the reason he got into this cloud busting is he said, allegedly discovered this energy, which he called Oregon energy. I've read a lot about that, yeah. which uh, is a kind of a life energy. And he, and he connected it to uh, or initially where, where, where he started with this was in his work in sex, sexuality and sexual repression, which mm -hmm. he he saw coming out of the Freudian school of psychoanalysis that that it uh, so sexual repression would lead to psychological problems, which we know that's true, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so absolutely true. And so he was trying, and he wrote a book, I think it came out in 1928 called The Function of the Orgasm, really trying to understand this and understand what we do to ourselves in, in, our, in our sexual lives. Now, let me interject something here that they have. <laughs> so I haven't read a lot of William Blake. I've read a, a lot about him, but then there's also stuff about him from kind of a Catholic apologetics take. And I've read the take and I just don't know enough to know how much it's true, but I think it works within a certain framework. So you could have the, um, you could, the opposite of repression could be expression, but that expression could be channeled or dissipated, you know, and the worst could be the corruption of the best. And right. at least some Catholic hot takes, and I think they were trying to quote stuff, were not just even accusing him of being maybe ignorant of the differences, because um, the differences could be all important, but that, um, and I, I'd have to look this up, but some quote to the effect that like, if you brought this stuff into like all the, all the monasteries and all the convents kind of quoting William Reich, don't know if it's true, you know, that you'll see everybody leave in droves because like God will cease to exist for them. And I wondered if he thought God was just like, you know, some specter that the repressed mind comes up with or something. No, actually he believed in God. And yeah. though I think he had, you know, he was, and he was really attracted to the figure of Christ. He's got a book called The Murder of Christ. So he saw Christ as like the, the one liberated person, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think he thought Jesus was divine or anything, but, but, well, maybe he's been to the but and, and yeah. when he was in prison, and then one of the things his, his son writes in the book is that the thing, the thing he kept in his cell in prison was that famous engraving or etching of Albrecht Dürer of the praying hands, right? Well, oh, yeah, yeah, right. So he's a more complex figure than that. But it's true that um, uh, people who applied Reich's ideas about letting go, the, letting sexuality out of the <laughs> out of the box. Yeah, that that and he's accused of being a, an apostle of free love or whatever. But so is William Blake. Right? Yeah, right. Right. 
Um, but and the I, Vogel. I don't I think it's more complicated than that because and also he, you know, he uh one of the you know one of the things he he was out of the school of Freud, he thought homosexuality was a, a mental disorder, right? Mm -hmm. So so to, to to saddle him with all those kinds of things, I think is wrong. But what I think is interesting yeah. is uh, one of the things he came up with, which I think is a really fascinating idea, is this idea of armoring that, you know, that beings or organisms, we could say, in hostile environment acquire armor they to protect do. themselves from that hostile environment. So looking at the example of the desert. So. I'm thinking armadillos, cacti. I'm thinking of uh, lots of other insects that are pretty well armored. And they all have armor, right? Yeah, yeah. They all have tough skins with spikes and stuff, right? To protect the inside, mm -hmm. which is soft, like cactus, right? Um, so he, and he, so by analogy, he said, now look at people who grow up in hostile environment. What do they get like? They get armored as well. Absolutely. Right? Hard on the outside, trying to protect something. And so one of his, uh, goals in psychoanalysis was to help people de-armor, uh -huh. right? To de-armor. And he would even, one of the points in uh, Peter Reich's book, he would, uh, Reich would off, often push against Peter's stomach to see that it, he wasn't tight and hard, that he could be open and free flowing, which yeah. is kind of an interesting thing, right? What do you and, think about uh, just one thing, you know, you work with young people too, but Right now, if when there's this huge call for resiliency training, right? Do you see those as a pendulum swing, or maybe working on two different tracks? Because we're both we're both kind of can see roles for both of those. There's no doubt. But could a society become so disarmored right now that people are asking to like? No, our 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 society is is hyper armored. I think it's armored. Yeah, hyper armored. I think, and I think that's what happens with propaganda programs and mass formation, which he was all against. I mean, he was he was a Jew, even wasn't out of practicing, but he was a Jew who had to leave Austria to get away from the Nazis, mm -hmm. right? So he hated totalitarianism, and he thought totalitarianism was the was the ultimate armoring of a society yeah right it's the anti it's the opposite of freedom yeah and i suppose i suppose again <clears throat> that. and people two things one is mentioning william reich if there's some shady things for people you and i would both agree and this isn't revolutionary i just have a feeling that some of our listeners like if i was in high school my college days i was just kind of in catholic apologetics you know you're look you're looking for totalizing arguments this guy was a heretic or he wasn't a heretic yeah and that you know that doesn't leave you too many places you know and we need more people or we'd say you know we all we both know priests we have correspondence with them and you're telling them an interesting book you read and they go oh you realize that's not totally approved. it's on the index yeah. yeah we need we need people other than priests and i think it's all of us individually to say like we got to go looking for this stuff we take our guidelines you can use the magisterium or authority or your own religious tradition as a guide but we definitely need more spiritual explorers. But that being yeah. said, um, this notion that uh, maybe like the internet, you know, the internet could have been liberating and it can also become of totalizing control. Which we is know it, that, yeah. you know, an expression of sexuality can be liberating, but we know that libido dominandi, like when they just get you addicted to sex, they can lead you any which where. And we're definitely living in a time where that second one is true. And, but and we're, both agreeing we're not laying it all at the foot of William Reich, but it does make those people who are looking for an etiology and a genealogy, you're necessarily going to go to that guy, you know, yeah. you're kind of at a watershed, you know, or where a path breaks. Um, and he was just giving ideas. And one path took some of those insights and tried to use it for, you know, enslaving people to pornography and everything else. And, but, and that's, that's the thing is, uh, unless we become liberated in our own thinking and being we're subject to slavery of any kind i mean for, for as far as i'm concerned uh some kind of radical tra traditionalists you know trady catholics are just as enslaved as anybody who's addicted to pornography though it might be a it might be a healthier slavery uh -huh. you know but it's not ultimately healthy because then you you know we, then it leads into the pre-sexual abuse scandal right absolutely which is exactly what reich was trying to avoid yeah yeah right that's they weren't that's not liberation yeah that's so another kind of say it's kind of a blend that all <clears> the, <throat> you know and be you know fight back on this but you'd see some convents where you had so much repression then a wave of liberation came in but again it was so built up that it was not channeled you well, know everybody in every convent was sleeping together in seminary and everything like that you know this is tricky stuff but the answer isn't continued massive 
repression. Yeah, and as we you mentioned the other day, I can't remember, you were talking about your friend who was talking about the seminaries and the priesthood and how many repressed homosexuals are inhabiting that space, oh. which I know from experience because the one of the parish priests at my church when I was a kid, I was an altar boy for this guy, was one of the the most notorious child predators in the Catholic Church's history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and in fact, I remember. I was, I might have been 17 or 18. My friend, my friends and I were telling my mom about this. No, he likes boys, mom. Cut it out. And no. And she's like, boys, you can't talk about him like him like that. He's a priest. <laughs> you know, we're, mom, I'm telling you right now, he does. He, he asked my friend for a massage. Yeah. No man does that. Right. And then 20 years later, there's an article in the Michigan Catholic about this guy going up the river. And my mom calls me on the phone. Mike, did you see this? What? Yeah. Father Shirilla is going to prison because he's been sexually abusing boys. I said, Mom, I told you that 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I couldn't believe you because he was a priest. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you regarding um, your cloud buster. So, and you might. Oh, yeah. We're talking about that, right? <laughs> no, but once in time, I'm seeing the same. There's these things, you know, again, I say two things that look similar on the outside could be universes apart, suicide and martyrdom, you know, Chesterton said. To an outsider, you can see similar motivations. If you get on the inside, they're not. Yeah. We've talked about other things like this. I'm thinking cloud busting. You mentioned that right now you have big multinationals. You have governments looking at this. And then you have your little cloud buster. What's yeah. to say that your form of weather control is good and the other one's nefarious? Or maybe you're not even going in that direction. Tell me your experience with cloud busting. Start getting at some of these nuances. Yeah. So anyway, so so after I met that, my, my friend and I had that conversation about Kate Bush and Peter Reich, and I read this book, about a year later, maybe more, uh, a friend of mine was a chiropractor who knew I was into biodynamic agriculture and alternative ways of growing and thinking about things. He said, I got to introduce you to this guy. So we get in his car and we go, or I think we, we both, we drove separately, but we go to this, this house in Farmington, Michigan, okay. which is about as That's suburban as it yeah. gets. Yeah. It's not, was not wealthy. It was middle-class. Okay. Um, so we're driving through this subdivision and every house looks the same. They all have the same shrubbery. They have the same chem lawn service. And then we get to this house where everything's wild. I like to reference to chem lawn. Go ahead. Everything's wild. And he's got, there are fruit trees all over the place. There are fig trees. There are peach and apple trees. And the grass is, you know, four feet high. And we get out of the car and he goes, look, he shows me look we look at around around the uh the perimeter of the property he has made a creek and there are frogs and turtles and toads and snakes and all kinds of animals <clears throat> and i'm like wow this is crazy we go into the house and we're sitting in the kitchen his i think his daughter let us in and we're waiting for this this man to come and talk to us and i'm looking around the kitchen and there's like books and piles of big bags of carrots and there are these ducts going through that like obviously made because they're they're made from uh plywood and they're going across the ceiling and up from the floor i'm like and i'm sitting there with my friend just looking around kind of mesmerized by all this stuff and my friend leans over the table he says you're waiting for something to explode in the basement <laughs> and i was it sounds like a <laughs> animated telling of the tale which is pretty good you know the little prince's work of genius you know but uh, there's a, a recently animated one that kind of sets that story with an, another story of an eccentric inventor, the voice by Jeff Bridges. But the guy you're describing kind of captures, or I yeah. was thinking of uh, Christopher Lloyd's role in Back to the Future a little bit. But Yeah, and he comes out of the basement. But more poetic, go ahead. And basically, the door goes boom, and he comes out, and he's wearing striped pants and a plaid shirt, or the other way around. And he's got... Uh, goggles up on top of his head and he oh, has he his spectacles over his forehead and he's not wearing and it's like he has six eyes and he comes oh. out and he's got a beard and he's gray hair he's probably in his 50s at the time starts talking almost in the middle of a sentence mm -hmm. and then i said to dr steiner i said and whatever he, yeah so so he starts that we start talking to this guy and he's giving me this the, all this this rap about Rudolf Steiner and his work with chemical ethers and biodynamics. And he talks about, keeps talking about Wilhelm Reich. You know, I said, oh yeah, I read about this book about that, him. And I, he shows us his backyard where he has his garden and it's phenomenal. I mean, I've never seen such a healthy garden, especially yeah. in the middle of the city. And he's got 
to Cloudbuster. I said, hmm. what's, and I didn't know what it was. And I said, what's that thing? It's, oh, that's my little Cloudbuster. I said, wow, you, you have one of those? I read about that. And explain to me a little bit how it worked. And I was just fascinated. Um, his name was Herman Menke. Hmm. He died recently. He was in his late eighties. Uh, at the time he looked like a, a you know, normal kind of person. Uh, he took on a more of a, of Moses vibe later in, in life. It's a cool vibe. Um, and he had a store, I think it's still there, called The Tree House, which I think his daughter runs now. I haven't been there in a long, long, long time, but my son's been there. Um, so we had this great conversation. Of, you know, he's sharing information, and I was really fascinated by his, his entire project, and impressed by the, his gardening results for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I left, and I'm, I would drive by because my mother and father lived only about a mile away from there. So I, whenever I go to see my mom, I drive by it's just to see what, how the garden was looking. Um, a, maybe six months later, <clears throat> a friend of mine who was actually uh, training to be uh, an organic farmer at the, the UC Santa Cruz uh, organic gardening program they had. And he came home to visit during Christmas. And I said, I got to introduce you to this guy. So we get in my car and his friend comes with us and we go to vis- visit Herman. And I, I had made some biodynamic 501 preparation with uh, amethyst rather than quartz that I wanted to give him some. And so we go there. He's talking to us. He's talking to us now about not only Steiner and Reich, but also Victor Schauberger. Yeah. What a hero. Water yeah. wizard. Of Many Germany. shows coming on him. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, great conversation. And, but he stopped. He goes, all right, guys, who's been smoking dope? You know, I was like, I didn't smoke marijuana. I was, I was about in my early 30s at the time. Yeah. And my friend's like, not me. And uh, so he puts uh, the some of the prep I gave him into this egg-shaped container, like a ceramic egg, where he, he triturates or spins it in there for just five minutes or so. And then he sprays it on us. And in the room, it goes, I had to do this because somebody smoked a dope and it's making, giving, giving me, giving, uh, making me disoriented. Huh. I was like, we're like, we're still looking at him. So what's this guy crazy? It's like, the same you know. preparation you bought him, he would use to dissipate like weird marijuana vibes. Yeah. Good, God bless him. Some people just see these things. I don't. You know? So, and, and then actually, I think I bought a copy of a book on Victor Schauberger called Waters of Life. It's okay. a place in my house. Uh, fascinating book. Uh, so we leave, or we're going back to my house and we're, out, we're driving. And my friend's buddy said, wow. That was weird, man. I only smoked a little bit of dope before I came. I just had a roach dude, in my ashtray. Dude, pretty, pretty wild. And, pulled out on dope smoking when I said wow. I dope and I actually smoked dope. It must have freaked him out too. I would think so, yeah. To be so, in those surroundings and be like, you know, just being spotlighted. <laughs> so, the, so those were my initial uh, exposures to the idea of cloud busting and yeah. this kind of energy. But then, so we have to fast forward to... So that was probably 1992 or so. So fast forward to 20 some years, 25 years later. So we moved to this farm here and uh, the first year, which is 2016, where you were here and I, it was my first garden here. So I, we didn't have a CSA. I wanted to see how the land was. And uh, I had a garden in the lower part of my property and not too far from where we have a pond. I've been in that pond. I jumped into the pond with Scott Martin. Shout out. No, Scott. Shout out to Scott and uh, no relation. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the next year we were having these insane rainfalls, like five inches of rain a week. Just insane. It was, it flooded out our garden. We had a CSA we had to take care of. Oh my gosh. And also the farms in the neighborhood were all getting flooded out. Yeah. So out of desperation, because I, I knew from talking to Herman and from what I had read that not only could you make it rain with a cloud buster, you make it stop. So I said, well, it's worth a shot. So I bought some copper pipe. Is it like a switch, like rain, no rain? Rain no. Well, let me, let me, let me, okay, let me okay. check it out. Check it out. Mm-hmm. So, so I bought this copper pipe and I had a bunch of wood in my barn. And so I get kind of improvised and made what I thought was a cloud buster. And so I wheel, and, and the idea with the cloud buster to make it stop raining is you drop the hoses into water which and you aim the pipes of the cloudbuster where uh, the you can see that where the greatest concentration of humidity or wa- water is or the storm in the center Fair of the enough. storm. Yep. And now we have an advantage over Wilhelm Reich, who was in, who died in 1957. Doppler. We, ha- we have yeah we have a radar map 
in our pockets, right? He didn't have that. He had, can you imagine? So it, it was more hit and miss for him <coughs> than well, it is for us. Are just kind of looking or are you trying to target when they're still 20 miles out? Like how much of an advantage does it give? Like I live in, we live in a hilly area, but I can see the clouds coming from the West. I'm guessing for, you know, but it just helps you set it up ahead of time. I'm guessing, or is it a very, very distinct advantage? Let me show you. Hold on. Uh, can you, I see cloud busting them. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to Facebook here. So, because I don't know where the fo photograph is. Should take a second to be tappy. Almost there. There we are. There's my cloud buster. Okay. That's pretty this cool. is my, this is not the one I used six, six years ago. This is yeah. the one I just made last year. That's a great picture of a cloud <coughs> buster in addition to a great cloud buster. Yeah. And it looks like a busting cloud. So here it was. Okay. So here's the thing. So I, I did this and, yeah. and I dropped it. We were getting another deluge and I dropped the hoses in the water, pointed it where I saw the most, the heaviest part of the cloud cover coming sure. from. And it stopped within 10 minutes. Uh, we still got more rain like the next day, but it's, it, it started to behave itself. And I thought, you know, could be a coincidence. Sure. You need a control group. And I was I'm not totally, <clears throat> I was, like I said, it was just out of desperation. I thought I'll try this. I don't know what else to do. Um, but I tried it a couple more times and it seemed to work within 10 minutes. And I, and I went discussing it with my friend, Drew, wh whom you met at uh, the conference in 2016. Yeah. And he drew it lives about six miles away. So, and he's like, I don't know, this sounds crazy. It might work. And then one, we have another deluge and he's got a little farm too. So he texted me as in, 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 in jest, really. He said, dude, can you do something about this rain? And I'm like, BRB. So, yeah. I go outside, I dropped the hoses in the water, pointed it where I thought the, the rain was coming. It stopped in 10 minutes, which sold Drew. And, and then I see, there's- I see a storyline starting again, like these questions I have that like, again, the independent guy with his land, as opposed to like a top down one size fits all. That's just a theme, but go ahead. Like I'm tracking themes on this because the microcosm uh, always mirrors the macrocosm in these stories, go. Uh, and, and then I have another friend, Brent, who lives uh, maybe, eight miles south of us who also has a farm and he knew it. he he got caught when i was doing and he, he's at the point now where uh he'll he'll text me he goes uh do you mind not using the cloud buster i'm trying we're trying to get some rain over here <laughs> because there's a way you can use a cloud buster that will like, i i think what it does it creates a kind of envelope in the atmosphere so it keeps rain from come from moving yeah, in or right. clouds from moving in i thought it was going to be like he's coming say can i borrow um uh, my wife needs a cup of sugar from Bonnie and I need like a bandsaw. And uh, can I borrow your cloud buster for a little while? Well, that's basically it. Yeah. I said, well, he's pretty, he's much more mechanical and gifted in building things than I am. So he can be, he can make his own. Okay. Uh, but the, so this is the, like you mentioned, Bonnie, my wife, right? So when I was first building this thing, she was like, what are you wasting your time? We have other things to do. I'm like, oh, well, I'm just going to try, you know, if it works, it works. It doesn't, it doesn't. And, but she's convinced enough now because I've made it rain a few times. In fact, quite a few times this summer, I made it rain. And she's convinced that it, that it works because now she, she expects it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Like, you know, and she's, you know, we'll have, she'll say, you should have made it rain yesterday. I said, well, I didn't want to be messing with the weather all the time. You should have made it rain. And, uh, you know, I keep teasing her and the kids think it's funny that uh, yeah. I said, you know what? Other couples don't have these discussions. <laughs> <laughs> They just don't. <laughs> Things non Martins talk about. Yeah, yeah. you know, other other uh, other wives don't tell, yell at their husbands about the. It, I know it's it's also I I do some annulments for the parish. It's not it's not on the annulment form. Is the reason why a marriage broke up? Like disagreements over the use of uh, cloud busting. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So so this is how I get into it, and I and I'm, I am convinced there were now at what happened like about a year ago. I don't know how well. What, what happened, but I don't know how it happened, is my cloud bust, buster, which during the summer, I keep down on the dock that you and you and Scott jumped off up into my pond. Don't tell me it got busted. Your cloud buster got busted? It ended up in the pond. Yikes. And I don't know. I don't. And it had been there. It had, the, had the been there through. It's a new militia group, the anti rikians who go around yeah. Michigan. Well, you know what? Get this. So I told you about Herman. One of the things Herman told me was that he had a visit from the FBI. Huh. About his cloud buster. Yeah, right, right, right. Definitely did. And he said, oh, I just my little cloud buster. I don't have any weapons over here. So DARPA visited him. And at first I was like, 
just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not really out to get you, right? Yeah. Um, that uh, I didn't know if it was blown in by the wind, which did not seem plausible because we looks had like some a pretty pain. heavy thing there. You got a lot. Well, of this one's not that heavy. The but other one was super pipes? heavy. Those pipes are kind of what are those pipes made of? Copper. That's that's at least 150 pounds. No. Really. Okay. Maybe it, well, maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred. It's not super heavy. Okay. This one anyway. Um, and this one's on wheels and the other one was not on wheels. Yeah. I think it rolled but, it. The but the other one ended up in the pond and uh -huh. I fished it out and it was, I had to get rid of it except for the, I okay, saved the pipes. These are the same pipes, but the other one I made had two, this has six pipes. They're five feet long each. Cause it's from six, 10 foot pipes. I cut in half. Um, the other one, I had in two rows of three pipes. Okay. You know, almost like you would see on a six on dice, right? Uh -huh. um, but this one I decided to tighten up and make closer. So it's basically a five pointed star pattern with one in the center. You can see that one sticking out. Wow. Um, th and this, and I use uh, uh, electrical conduit for pipes or for hoses, I should say. This one seems to be really much more effective than the other one. And this image right here is from back in March when we had. And we can talk about this in a second. Chemtrails, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of controversy about that, right? Um, and they had been there in the sky, you can see, and I pointed the Cloudbuster, and within 10 or 15 minutes, it did this to the chemtrails. Hmm. Um, and Reich would call this, well, he would call what you see in chemtrails, um, DOR or dangerous organ. Okay. And it looks like what I did here is introduce some positive organ into it. Now, his word was Oregon. Other people have different words. Uh, if you go back into medieval and early modern science, natural science, this is what they called ether. It really Okay. So I wondered, but you're saying a one-to-one -one correspondence, people could read Reich and just substitute the word ether. I think so. Okay. And there, and, and he was trying to figure out a new vocabulary for it, make it more, some more scientific. And more sexual. Modern, you know yeah. I mean? And more like sexual. <clears throat> and Steiner talked about chemical ethers and stuff like this. Uh -huh. um, and I think now, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about um, chemtrails. Now, I was as skeptical as anybody about this chemtrail thing, right? I didn't, I thought, come on, no one is going to spread this stuff to poison people. Well, what's, what's the main, so if I don't even know, like I, I come across the term, I've probably read some, I've never done a deep dive. What's the, let's say I was a total cynic. What do I think about them? It would be that the government is spreading through two trails in the sky or whatever. They're spreading various things or specifically like one sort of chemical. Uh, there are aluminum oxide, I think is one of them, barium okay. and other things. The gold this, and there are, you know, I, I don't, I've seen documentaries that actually they go in planes and they measure the levels of barium or uh, aluminum in, and these are, these are trails that come from airplanes or jets, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but what happens with, with, with what they, what are called chem trails is these, these trails go across and they don't go away. Uh -huh. What they do is they kind of spread and you, by the end of the day, and, and sometimes you see dozens and dozens of these things going across the sky, yes, which sure. I don't know about you, Mike, but I don't remember seeing that when I was a kid. Not as much. And again, what's the claim made? Like uh, brain control? Like Something what they... like that. And oh, okay. here's what, so here's where I was with this, yeah. right? When I, I had the cloud buster and I had heard about chemtrails, I said, well, at the very least, the stuff that's coming out of those planes can't be healthy. Right. Right. Even if it's just pollution, it's still pollution. I said, so well, let's see if I can, you know, neutralize them. Or do something, you know, and as you can see right here, and it actually, when I made the second design of the Cloudbuster, I got more of these kinds of feathery patterns uh -huh. in the sky. And other people I know who've been interested in this, they say, yeah, that's, that's, that's organ energy dissipating the DOR. Huh. Um, so, and, you know, and uh, so I figured, you know, it's worth a shot. If I, if I see them, if, if it's only pollution, good. If it's chemtrails, even better, right? Now, if we, and, if we, and you'll see but before you go that, before, yeah, yeah, you'll see sometimes, and I see them. <clears throat> I'll look in the sky. I'll see a couple jets going by with these long chemtrails going behind them, like a cover of the sky. And sometimes you see them in a kind of a grid pattern, right? It's certainly. Um, sometimes I've even seen them in five pointed star patterns, believe it or not. Mm. Um, so you see that, and then you'll see another jet going by with nothing. I've totally seen that. So I can tell the viewers I've seen that. You know, or you'll see a jet where it has what's called a contrail, which is a short trail behind it. 
of they think condescension, you know, co condensation from you know, just like you would get a dehumidifier, I guess. Um, it's just ice crystals, and it goes, but it goes away, and it doesn't take over the whole sky, and it doesn't spread. So I figured it, it's worth worth a shot. Just in the chemtrail debate, ever it happens to be. Do does anybody admit that like at least planes are leaving these two? long lines or yeah. do they say you're not seeing them or do they say no those are just contrails but there's very little atmospheric activity so they just linger longer is that the standard rejoinder that's one of them yeah i mean okay. and and i was cool with that explanation for the longest time because uh -huh. i didn't think the government would do anything to poison us until the last two years um <laughs> so so here's a, a funny story so i was experimenting this is a couple of years ago with the old i think it was my first cloud buster so I was just experimenting to see whether it worked or not. You know, I was not completely sold, you know, doing some experiments, you know, seeing what, what kinds of results I would have. And I made it rain a few times. I haven't, didn't make it rain a lot the first, first time I had first year, cause I didn't want to mess with the weather. Um, and I noticed though, so say I have, um, I look on with the weather map, the radar, and I see and we're in we're in middle south, middle central or central south uh, Michigan. So if I'll see, say there's a a rain system over by Chicago or in Indiana or even a little bit far, farther you know, over the Lake Michigan, I'll see if I can pull it over. <clears throat> and so I'll point, I'll drop the hoses in the water, point it in the direction where the rain system is. Drop the hose in the water. You're drawing water. Drop. Don't have the hoses in the water. You're trying to dissipate water. Yes, exactly. Okay. And that will dissipate uh, chemtrails or whatever. Yeah. So, and I'll see if I can pull it over. And it always works. Uh -huh. Now, <clears throat> the thing is with, with that way to, to going about it, you kind of have to babysit it because it seems to me that the rain systems are like animals where they need to be <laughs> directed a little bit. Uh -huh. They want to move the other way. You go, okay, I'm out for this way. Um, so yesterday, for instance, I I put it out because I saw we hadn't had rain in over a week and wanted to get some moisture. And there was there was rain not too far away. So I put it out, but I didn't have time to babysit. And it rained, but not at our farm. It rained three miles south of us. Uh -huh. So it came near. And that, that happens sometimes. But other times you can do it. There's a way to do it where this is what Reich would do, where he would set it out for, say, three to six hours and calling a draw. And then turn it off, you know, which is for turning off means putting, pushing the hoses or the, the pipes toward the earth or toward the water. Uh -huh. And usually within 24 to 48 hours, you get rain. And I've done that quite a few times this summer where most places in Michigan had were experiencing drought and we were getting an inch of rain a week. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it worked. I mean, yeah. you could say it's coincidence. Maybe it is, but I have a lot of coincidences, right? Right, right, right. And that's where probably I am with it until I would try it. But I, I think, you know, that... You know, I always think about the not exclusively, but the larger picture. You know, you could have you could have farmers trying to draw. Off, you have a canal or a lake trying to draw off and canalize some water to their garden and things. We've done that since time immemorial, going back to Mesopotamia. You know, and you're trying to do something up there. Because I'm still wondering, not that there is no distinction, but we want to get into the distinction of like why you effing with the weather is a good thing, why other people doing it could be bad. But right now, without forcing anything, you know, I, I see that like the individual landowner has done similar things. But when you get something like the enclosure movement, which we've talked about, or huge top down designs, you know, part of this regeneration podcast is um, in saying everything good, bad, left, right, politically, you know, that we get we can get pretty far if you use frameworks of like liberty and tyranny and bottom up versus top down. Right? Well, I, I think. I think I, I don't know if I even have a Facebook profile description of myself, but if I do, it was put up 20, 20 years ago. It's just, I prefer bottom up solutions to things. Individuals, you know, kind of networking with other individuals yeah. trying to like. And I think that the difference between what I'm doing and what DARPA is doing or China uh -huh. is doing. What does DARPA stand for? I can't remember. I don't it's even know. Bad. What is it? I don't even know what it is. It's a cool sounding Satan, organization. Satan or something like that. Um, yeah. I think the difference is is what I think we're, what you're dealing with when you're working with uh, this kind of energy, the, or, this organ or if, if the, the ethers, it's good, right? It's life yeah, it's, it's like, it's like dancing with them. you're dancing with them as opposed to making them into a Frankenstein monster. Right. And, I think, them. and I think by analogy, it's the difference between uh, biodynamic agriculture and industrial agriculture. Let's say more about right? that. Where biodynamic agriculture is, um, it, part of it is a healing of the earth. Right. Yeah. It's not it's not exploitive. Yeah. 
it's not an exploitation of the earth. It's a healing of the earth. It's working with the energies of what not only the seasons and the sun and everything, but the energies of, of the soil. And you, you do, you work to influence the soil, yeah. but you're not exploiting it. Right. Right. And I think that's the difference between cloud busting and, you know, cloud seeding or dart, whatever these China was doing. Right. Yeah. And, and because, and, and I, and it, like, man, gosh, if I can do this with 80 bucks worth of pipe, can you imagine what somebody with a budget of $2 billion <laughs> could do? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the thing is, what, as we, you know, there's a great video out there of John Lennon talking about world leaders, you know, talk about why is there still war? I mean, it's like, you know, these people get in, into power. They're like, they're homicidal maniacs. They're just insane. They totally are. And they are. And they're still that way. Yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you can think of like St. Louis of France. You could get somebody who, you know, hereditary monarchy, at least some of those guys can turn good. But who now with the current political system could ever climb that and not end up woefully corrupted to the point of uh, the worst yep. crime? In yeah. fact, there was a video I saw on Twitter yesterday of Vladimir Putin, and he was talking about the United States, and he said about, about the, the president. Black box. Yeah, no, he's talking about the president. He said, oh. he said, you know, you know, some guy comes into office, he has all these ideals and good ideas and stuff, and oh, then the guys with suitcases. I yeah. said, black box. yeah, the I guys think- with the suitcases come in. This is how it's going to be. Yep. Right. Yep. And I, I mean, I, you saw that happen with Barack Obama. Yeah. You know, who was all who was all pro organic and pro natural. And those guys must have come in there and said, nope, you're going to be supportive of Monsanto. You're going to put Tom Vissilak in charge of agriculture or the or the war criminal, you know, George Bush, the second who came into office saying, you know, we're not seeking monsters to destroy anymore, only to just, you know, find monsters first time. Nation. He's not about nation building. Right. And those guys came and said, oh, yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. And what comes to mind politically, too, regarding some of this is, um, and you'd be aware of this, but it was said so well, oh, maybe even 15 years ago, a lot of our listeners would know the name Patrick Janine, yeah. who um, writes for Front Porch Republic. And you know he's got a lot of insights, but one was looking at the political divides between left and right as saying, again, the right would say, don't change this male into a female, like this ecosystem, my body, don't put birth control in there. Um, don't mess with this. A man's a man, a woman, a woman. But like you can turn that hill into a casino by flattening the hill and you can take this river out and you can turn a desert, you know, and so, but we can mess with things out there. And the flip side is the, um, the left, you know, maybe drawing with uh, too big of a brushstroke, but it certainly gets at something. The left would say you could never touch that sacred earth, you know, no chemicals in that field, but certainly put chemicals in media control birth, change, you know, what lop off my penis and things like that, you know, but we're still, um, you know, that the way, the way we look at ourselves and the way we look at the environment sacramentally, right. symbolically, yeah. that's the tertium quid. That's what's going to see us through this morass. Taking shelter with one of the two political tribes is not going to get you anywhere. You no. end up, you're either going to like disfigure yourself if you're a leftist or you're going to disfigure the environment if you're, if you're from the capitalist adoring right. You know, it's this, um, this student loan thing for another one, but you know, some people can, sane people can agree or disagree, but the, the, the Democrats are pandering to their base, but we have to remember the Republicans would pander to the capitalists and the banks, you know? No well, hard, I mean, no. that's, that, that's the assumption, but, you know, if you look back at the last decade or so, oh, yeah. uh, the, there were Democrats are so in the, par- in the yes. pockets of the banks and the corporation now. Yeah. I mean, going back to Obama, I would say. But also these intelligence agencies, you know? Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, it's wickedness. It's ab- and this is the thing. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, for, for me, in a way, this my my excursions into cloud busting are yeah. actually an outgrowth of this my increasing christian anarchist sensibility about things yeah yeah you know that not only is it sacramental but it we i mean i i feel that i have an obligation to to heal the earth i mean at least yeah. the little piece of earth that that I'm privileged to, to, to stand on. Yeah, and it, you do make it clear. Remember, I don't know, coming into this conversation, we hadn't debriefed or anything. Um, you know, I'm sitting here now an hour in saying, gosh, should if I know whether the thing works or not? I, you know, I trust you. You're a good friend. I know you're open-minded. So uh, like everything, you know, like I'm saying, well, let's, you know, people need to try more things. I was interested in, you know, what makes your form of weather control good, but other ones bad. Right. And I've kind of come to some, lineaments of that. I certainly don't have 
any sense, you know, that what you're doing is other than like taking a few. It, I live near one of these beautiful finger lakes. You know, I could go down there and just grab a bunch of water. You're doing it in kind of a different way. We all kind of, when you said, I like the image that you're trying to tease things like pets, you know, that you can set it up and ignore it. It's not going to work. But if you want to kind of play with a, a weather mass that might have a personality or something, you know, and kind of tease him or her towards you. I don't know. I like it. You know, it fits with my poetic well, sense. Of these making now. it rain during drought is not messing the environment. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. That's that's bringing healing. And here, and now there was we, we did a double blind study one. Yeah. So check this out. This is kind of a funny okay. story. And I'm googling. I'm putting up "make it rain" in the Urban Dictionary because I think it. You know, it's also when um, for young people that phrase colloquial means uh, a slang term for throwing out lots of cash to dancers and strip clubs as if money is raining down on them. You know, so uh, every time we've been saying "make it rain." We have uh, a lot of things going on. Yeah, we're gonna get a lot of we're gonna get a lot of hits, and people are gonna be really disappointed. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still, old guys talking title, about. We should title this one "Make It Rain." Yeah. So anyway, so here's my we're double blind story. Thing, by the way, go ahead. Yeah. So um, maybe it's two years ago in the winter. It was probably March or February. It's cold, and it was a Sunday, and I had driven into town. One of the the, the closest town is Chelsea, Michigan. So uh, close to big town. So I, I, I was my in, uncle used to run the proving grounds for Chrysler. Oh yeah, that's right over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I drove over there to go to the grocery store or hardware store or something. And I'm coming home and I look up in the sky in the west, and there were dozens, and I mean dozens of chemtrails. Uh-huh. Chemtrails, whatever you want to call them. And I'm like, oh man, I gotta hurry up and get home and put the cloud buster out there. So I'm driving, and then I get about a half mile down, and they've they're all going away. I'm like, wow said, is Bonnie using the cloud buster? She, she never touches the cloud buster. I get home and sure enough, the cloud buster is pointing up where, where those chemtrails were. Yeah, well. And I go in the house, I said, Bonnie, did you just do that? He goes, no, but I saw those chemtrails and I told Daniel, my son, who was then nine, yeah. to go point it up there. That's great. And he took him out and it went. And the thing is, it, I was seeing it happen, not knowing that somebody at my house was messing with the cloud buster. Now, do you I have like- I was like, what, exactly what had happened before. Do you have cloud busting Facebook groups and things like that? I mean, is there a community? Uh, there probably there? are. Yeah. There probably are. Like I, I, you want to share stories and work, you know, work with what's working for you, what's not working, you know, get a, a community of people that can kind of be self, uh, self-policing. self I mean, I, I know people who, who I have been into. In fact, it's kind of interesting story. So Herman Menke, who I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah. where I first heard about this stuff, he actually apprenticed quite a few people who would come to him and learn his learn the tool learn his his tricks and tools huh. and two young men well younger to us but were here at the farm one actually had some biodemic preparations he wanted me to, to give to me as a gift which is very nice and another one uh is that what had, farmers do? I didn't know that was a thing. I'm going to come with a preparation. Oh, it's very cool. I mean, they're yeah, hard to I make, like, and he gave yeah. me some really nice ones. That's cool. Uh, and uh, then, well, I think it was last year at Michaelmas, uh-huh. this young family came to, to celebrate with us. I had never met them before. They were invited by friends of friends. Yeah. And the guy, I'm talking to him, and he's standing. So you've been at my farm, so the, yeah. the barn and the house are on top of the hill. And we have the gardens and then the pond at the bottom. And so I had the cloud buster over there and he's looking out there and he, t- and he comes to me, are you, this is your house? I said, yeah, I goes, I knew I came to the right place. I said, why? I saw your cloud buster. That's funny. Yeah. And he used to train with Herman. Wow. So it was kind of a cool, it was an interesting thing. So they're out there, right? There yeah. are people out there trying to do this. And I think it's good work. It is. It is. You know, color me interested. There's no reason in my worldview why, you know, with the advancement of knowledge and people playing with things with a good spirit, like the good old scientists who just, you know, started fiddling with things, you know, with a, with a playful instinct, not and, one to dominate. And uh, w- why shouldn't this continue is where I'm at. Well, I think Nikola Tesla is another one, right? Sure, sure, sure. And again, oh, we mentioned Victor Schauberger. Victor Schauberger. There were people, and this is what, you know, um, and I have, my doctorate is in early modern English literature, and I wrote on re- mostly religious writing from the 17th century. But you study that period, and most of the people in my dissertation were alchemists of some type or yeah, right, another. Right. And, and I've written, in fact, even in uh, The Submerged Reality, I have a chapter on Robert Flood, who was also a scientist and physician, as well as being a mystic of a sort. And it's always been my position that um, 
there was something lost with Descartes and the scientific revolution, which which bifurcated maybe which, the thing, the bi thing. bifurcated. You know, the supernatural yeah. doesn't exist, and right. so in fact, that's when they said ethers do doesn't exist. They mm -hmm. don't exist anymore, right? Also, the life doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, Zoe and Bios, right? Zoe is the life that makes life life. Like when Jesus says, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, the Zoe is the word. Bios means habits of living. Like Bios is what I do for a living, or, you know, what constitutes the, the physiognomy of a frog or right. whatever, right? Everything is Bios. But it's, but it's Zoe is the thing we love, we lost, yeah. right? Or you could say the soul of the world or Sophia, right? And I think uh, things like this business with cloud busting or, or, um, Reich's discovery of the Oregon is, or rediscovery of ether, whatever you want to call it, right? It shows us that uh, science as it's been delivered to us is not all there is to, to science or to right. natural science, right? And I've always questioned whether uh, if uh, the scientific revolution had not kicked God and the supernatural to the curb, what kind of science will we have? And I, there are scientists out there who are asking those questions and not just, you know, fringe scientists like, like uh, Reich or even Tesla, who isn't fringe, but or there are people out right now, uh, Rupert Sheldrake is one of them, who are open to these questions. Uh, another one, uh, Brian, Brian, Brian Josephson, okay. Nobel Prize winner. He's also open to these questions, right? And, he, and they all have a serious critique of the scientific uh establishment being co-opted by corporations and governments which it has which it has by and large no denying there's no denying no. and as sheldrake, and sheldrake points out goes oh yeah you know talk about science well guess what there are not millions of dollars of research money going in to discuss to study butterflies no, okay? no. no. that uh who, who is uh bernard latour uh, is that his name the yeah. french he's, he's so good on that you know just on with a philosophical with a gentle approach just humbly waiting to the waters of the research, you know, on the success of double blind experiments, how it is anthropologically and psychologically that scientists get swayed to see those results that bring them big money. You know, so it's not just an accusation. He tries to break it down, you know, how these things work. But it, we don't have to be, you know, sane people can start to agree on this because we're, we're talking about human nature, right. you know, and how things get co-opted and how, you know, we, we've mentioned so many times, Edward Bernays and so forth, but how advertising works, how, um, how big money works, but yeah, a good playful science, you know, uh, you're kind of carving your path to keep it going again. I have one question as we kind of wind up is um, if you want to get rich, I'm sure you're flowing in cash and have no need for money, you know but it. could you make a smaller one of these that people could use like on the cusp of a long car trip to kind of regulate or dissipate their need to take leaks during long journeys? You know, that's a cash cow, don't you? Um, yeah, I haven't thought about that. I, my son, actually, when he was in high school. Make water. I don't want to make water uh, on the four-hour thing. Can you help me? No. Uh, I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, my son made a little tiny cloud buster when he was in high school. Uh -huh. and, it's, and I didn't have a cloud buster at that point. But yeah. he made a little tiny one because he, he was interested in Kate Bush. And he, and he, uh, he was going to do a report on with Wilhelm Reich. He's now yeah. 30, almost 33, uh, which was kind of funny. I said, well, it's yeah. not going to really do much of its only tabletop size, right? Um, and he, that's the boy who had has visited uh, Herman's store quite a few times. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to look. Is that store still, if I'm in Michigan again, is that store? I still believe it is. My daughter? Huh. It's What's called, it called the Treehouse. I look forward to seeing it sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what are you doing for the rest of today? Uh, I'm going to make some cheese. Nice. I'm We're making farmer's food. cheese. And tomorrow yes. I'm going to make mozzarella. No, no, I'm going to make uh, ricotta tomorrow. Really? Yeah. Never made cheese. Well, good luck with that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning into the Regeneration what? Podcast. Again, if you're listening to the podcast, go check it out on YouTube. You can see some of the images. And um, and I have one more thing. Say it. Uh, Kate Bush. Yeah. This wouldn't have happened without you. And anytime you want to come on the podcast, you please. Be, you so can, she's still you alive. Find my email. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. She's I had a college lady, sweet right? mate who was definitely in love with her. You know, kind of in that way that, uh, like a movie star that she was glamorous. Yeah. Uh, but it was kind of that type of thing. But that was another, my freshman year was filled with Kate Bush because she had oh. she had Kate Bush posters all over his room. Okay, and, I, I have one more story. Okay. And this is true. This I've often had dreams that I was married to Kate Bush. Wow. And I couldn't figure it out why. And, and I'm telling my wife, I said, yeah, I keep dreaming I'm married to Kate Bush. Isn't that the weirdest thing? And she's like, 
no, it's not. I'm like, oh, sorry. Uh, but I figured out that my wife has features similar to Kate Bush. They don't look a lot alike, but there was one time I, I was watching a Kate Bush video with David Gilmore. And one of my kids came in and said, is that mom? You know, so they don't uh, look dissimilar. So I think that's what happened. David Gilmore, that would be new to me. She's like, oh, that's cool. It's a yeah, David Gilmore actually discovered her when she was yeah. a teenager. Oh, I didn't know that. And there's a video out there of Kate Bush and David Gilmore doing uh, live running up that hill. Wow. Which is very cool. Very, very well done from about 1989 or so. All right. But yeah. So Kate, you want to come on the show? We'll love to have you, Kate. We'll have to schedule you in. We'll have have to send references, but we'll get you in. (laughs) Everybody have a good week here at the Regeneration Podcast. We'll see you again next week. There we go. Cool.